Mark chapter 10. Let's see. Mark chapter 10. And uh, so we'll be preaching from there. I will today. And so let me pray. As you're looking for that, I'll say a couple words and then you can. And then we'll pray and we'll get right into it. I'd like to be down here where I can be close to you and see your reaction and keep you awake. That's why I'm down here. Uh, so uh, let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your love for us. I ask you bless our uh, this service time now, Lord, that it is uh, your word, and so I pray that your Holy Spirit would send it forth. You say that your word will not return void, void, and so I hope that people are aware today and they're awake, and that we can uh, we can have this time together to look into your word, to look into ourselves and our hearts. The Holy Spirit reproves us, as your word says, and corrects us and convinces us of things. And may your Spirit then work in this service. May you give me wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. So a question, I, I thought about what I was going to say, and then a lot of times I just like to think through things, and so I was talking to my wife, and I wanted to have an illustration. I like to open with an illustration and then kind of leave a cliffhanger until the end. This way, uh, like my wife says, I got to appeal to my audience more, and so <laughs> I'm trying to do that. But I couldn't think of a cliffhanger. So I thought, well... And so I asked her a couple of questions, and I said, and, and I would address this to you, and just think about what I'm going to say. You don't have to raise your hand or anything. But if you had the choice to be deaf or blind, I don't know. Like, if you were going to be smitten with deafness or blindness, almost everybody I've asked, almost everyone, would rather be deaf than blind. I don't know if you'd be that way. There's always that one person, I'm going to be different. Okay. But... You think about it, I, I've never been deaf nor blind, thankfully. I'm getting blind, <laughs> probably getting deaf too. But I've not been, so it'd be a little, diff, a little bit difficult for me to make a, a decision. Um, we, same thing with you, right? Why, why do we pick, typically, deafness? And so I was talking to my wife about it, and I said, well, what do you think about it? And she said, definitely deaf. And, uh, and I thought, well, okay, but if you've not been either, Maybe it'd be nice to be blind for a few days and then deaf for a few days, and then I can make a better decision. But um, typically we say blindness. I think that sight is something that's very precious to us. We want to be able to see things. My wife said, well, it's kind of scary being blind. I think maybe that, because we were trying to, to, to hit on exactly why that is. I don't really know. I mean, if you think about it, as a deaf person, you can't listen to a sermon ever again. That would not be good. And for as many things as you might say, well, yeah, but blindness prevents you from doing this. Well, we can do the same thing for deafness. But yet, sight is something that's very precious to us. I, I have an uncle on my mom's, my stepmother's side of the family, and he, is, um, he was blind. And so I, I grew up with him and uh, had to help him along. He went to um, a couple of schools, and I can remember he was quite a bit older than I am. He lives in Florida now. But at the time, he was in Dyer. That's where my grandparents were, Dyer, Indiana here. And so he made a clay. That is amazing to me, but he had art class. Okay, now he's blind, can't see a thing, in case you didn't know what blind meant. I just defined it for you. <laughs> so he, uh, he made this sculpture of himself out of clay. I'm telling you, it looked just like him. It's not something that I could have done at all. So I guess what he did is he just felt his face, and then he made the clay look like what he felt. I was astounded. I was amazed. I mean, it looked just like him. And uh, so I suppose our other sensors would, would take over. But I think most of us um, would probably like to be deaf rather than blind. Thankfully, we don't have that, have that choice. But sight is something very important to us. Blindness is something maybe that frightens us. Now, uh, Let's carry that over to the spiritual, and uh, we'll think about that as I read these verses. So go to the verse 46 there, and it says, And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now, this is not my point, but the blind Bartimaeus here had some understanding. By giving Christ the title Son of David, he's um, ascribing himself or, or believing in Jesus' lineage to have come from the, to the line of David. What he is saying by saying Son of David is that you're the promised one since the time of Abraham. It's you. 
So there's a lot that he's saying there when he says, Son of David. But then he says, Have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out the more, a great deal. I like that. He didn't care what they said. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still. Wow. Here's a blind man saying, son of, son of David, have mercy on me. And he stood still. Jesus was walking, and it made him stop in his tracks. And commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he casting away his garment, he was done with that rose and came to, G to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What will thou that I should do unto thee? Now notice what he calls him here. The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. So here's Bartimaeus. And now I, I've read some things about people that... Um, were blind, and then by some kind of surgery, not, not everybody can be done this way, but then some kind of surgery, they can receive their sight. And you would think, I would think, well, once they receive their sight, now everything's going to change for them. Everything's going to be different. And the habits of a blind person, they will no longer have. You might find it interesting to know that even though they can see, some of their habits of being a blind person are, are still with them. It doesn't happen immediately. I just kind of assumed it would. Strange. Not strange. I don't know what word you would apply there. I think it's kind of interesting. Let's just put it that way. But here you have blind Bartimaeus. And my, my point in all of this is, is this. I suppose if you're physically blind, you know it. I, I doubt there's a blind person out there that doesn't know they're blind. They realize that. Or if you're deaf. And even though they don't know what it's like to see, they know when they're blind. Spiritual blindness, however, is not always that way. Sometimes we're spiritual blind and we don't know. So a person that's physically blind has lost that perception. Okay, they can't perceive things. Their circuitry in their brain or whatever, it doesn't work. And so they can't see things. As a result, they can stumble, they can fall. I can remember my uncle banging his shins. He must have had callous shins because he would bang his shins all the time. And uh, so he just couldn't see where he was going. And if anybody moved anything around, it was a problem. But, uh, he, was, but he, he couldn't perceive anything. So blindness and a lack of perception... What could be that way spiritually? Maybe some of you sitting here, you're spiritually blind and you don't even know it. I would refer you to King Saul. He wist not, what does it say there? He wist not the Spirit of God departed from him. He didn't know. It, so in that condition, Saul was like a blind person that didn't know he was blind. How strange is that? Maybe a blind person walking around and they think maybe everybody's blind. This is perfectly normal. And sight and blindness really means nothing to him. It's kind of absurd, isn't it? Of course he knows he's blind. How would somebody walk around and say, you know what, you, you can't see a thing. You're blind. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not blind. Well, you are. You can't see anything. It's, it's absurd. It's bizarre. But that was the state of Saul. And I think not being able to perceive something and being spiritually blind, just as it's frightening to think that I might lose my sight, I wonder if it scares us to mu as much to realize that it might you lose your spiritual blindness, not be able to perceive things. Jesus told Bartimaeus, your faith has made you whole. So you might have heard preaching from this passage that deals with salvation. And certainly that's a good way to, to present it, without question. That's a very good way to preach this. But you can be saved and blind. Jump over, keep your place here. Jump over to 1 Peter. I believe I'll prove this to you. I'm taking the time to belabor this point because although I don't have tons of time, I do feel it's necessary. It's pointless to go on unless I establish this for you. So this is the groundwork. So I'm sorry to say First Peter, my fault. Second Peter. Not that far. Second Peter chapter 1. Let's go to verse 5. So Peter is talking to um, the saved people. Uh, we see that in verse 1, Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have attained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So I think that's convincing, isn't it? Who is he writing to? Saved people or unsaved people? It's pretty clear they're saved people. So then he gets to verse 5. He says, And beside this, give all diligence, add to your faith, virtue and to virtue knowledge, knowledge, temperance and, and patience and godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. <clears throat> 8. 4. 
if these things, what things, the things he just listed there, be in you and abound, they make you that you should neither be barren nor unfruitful in knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then look at verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is, what does it say there? Blind. He's not talking about physical blindness, is he? But if you lack these things, so you're blind. You cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That's a dangerous thing. Again, as scary as it might be, I would not like to lose my sight. Well, spiritual blindness is, if you ever knocked on doors, come across that person that you, they don't know uh, about salvation very much at all. You rehearse it, and they said, oh, yeah, I did that. You run across those people. What was their problem? Well, they never grew. They forgot that they were purged from their old sins. They had no idea. Their perception was gone. They were blind. And I think a big, big problem in, 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 in America, I guess any country really, is um, that the safe people aren't doing what they're supposed to do. I mean, we preach and teach, you have to give the gospel, and certainly that's true, absolutely. But if the people that claim to be saved would just do something in a decent church, maybe we could turn the country around that way. So I, I, think, um, I think you see that it's possible for somebody to be saved and yet be blind. Now, sometimes this lack of vision is a result of deception, the sleight of hand, if you will. The devil is a master at this, and he'll... He'll, uh, you know, a magician is back here, is something going on, he's trying to divert your attention over here, that kind of thing. And sometimes they're so good at it, they'll even tell you, and you still can't tell it after they tell you that they're doing it. And so uh, sometimes it's like that, and the devil is a master at diversion. Master. So what Mr. Schrock said, you know, um, it, you've got a break coming up. Okay. Um, and that's fine. But you... Whenever you let your guard down, for whatever reason, it's always a danger. You cannot do that. I've seen many, many, many times, and typically it's after a success. So right now you might say to yourself, well, I've gone through a, a, a few, few weeks of college, now I'm going to take a little bit of a break. There's a measure of success there, right? And you might think you deserve the break. I'm not saying you don't. don't that's not my point. But the point is you tend to let down your guard. And that's exactly what Satan is waiting for, typically. Because he's a master of deceit. And so he's, he'll distract you. You deserve it. That's the whole world system, right? You deserve it. If you're in my class, I talk about that a lot. Or you are beautiful. I'm finally recognized as being a beautiful person or, or whatever. But that's the world system. So is it possible, let me ask you this, to be saved and blind? Yes, to have no vision, as if there were a veil over your eyes. Yes. Many times... Satan will also blind us um, to our need. We're needy people, but we don't see it. What did uh, what the Lord tell the pastor of the church of Laodicea? I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Maybe you're there right now. I don't need this sermon. I'm thinking about home. Now, maybe you don't. I, I, it's not like the greatest preacher in the world. Okay, I get it. But you might think to yourself, well, I, I, uh, I'm just thinking about home. <laughs> I can't wait to get home. I'm going to do this, 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 uh, et cetera, et cetera. Many times the, the Satan will, will, will blind us to our need. It's funny. Bartimaeus knew his need. He was there begging. He knew he needed to beg. He knew he needed to. There was no other way. We'll get to that, in, hopefully, in a minute. But many times when you're spiritually needing... Um, and you should be, as it were, begging, like Bartimaeus, but we don't see the need. Wouldn't it be absurd if uh, people would say, you know, Bartimaeus, you really need to go, get begging. It's the only way you're going to receive anything. How can you get trip? How are you going to eat or anything? No, I, I know I'm blind, but I don't, I don't need to do that. I'll be fine. I'll just sit at home and somehow he's, he'd be blind to his needs. It's odd, isn't it? Spiritual blindness doesn't work exactly like physical blindness does. So, what, uh, what is the condition? What is your state this morning? Sometimes we're so busy, sometimes, looking at the faults of other people that we cannot see our own. Didn't Jesus talk about the moat and the beam? Oftentimes you can see it in other people. But you're blind, right, to your own needs, your own faults. Hypocrisy is that way. I don't know about you, but I can see hypocrisy real easily in other people. Piece of cake, no problem. I'm full of it sometimes. I can't see it in myself. 
but I can see it in other people. They're blind. So these are the things that cause blindness. So I'm saved, I praise the Lord, all of that. Well, you may be saved and sitting here completely blind. Maybe you're busy looking at the faults of other people. Maybe you're, maybe you're being deceived by Satan. Maybe Satan is uh, pulling a fast one on you, as it were. And you can't see your need. And you're blind. So as bad as it is to lose your physical sight and maybe to uh, trip over things and have a difficulty in life, I promise you, you'll have difficulty in your spiritual life unless you get this matter straightened. So what is the danger then? of remaining spiritually blind. You might say to yourself, well, I get what you're saying. I don't want to be spiritually blind. Of course not. But how do you know if you are or not? What's the measuring stick? Right? If I grab the tape measure, I can tell you exactly how wide this is. What's the measuring stick? Where am I at? What's the characteristic? How do I know that? Well, let's look at Bartimaeus. So I'm back to Mark chapter 10 if you're, if you're not there. And uh, if you are, if you remain, here's the danger. So I guess the question is this. I'll get to that, well, how you know. But what, you might say, so what? <laughs> so what? I'm doing okay. I'm in Bible college. I'm in all these classes. I pay attention to the Bible. I get Bible, Bible, Bible all the time. You're, now you're talking about spiritual blindness. I see some things in First Peter. I get it. But so what? You know, it's a little bit too difficult. I, I, I just don't know if I could do that. So I'd prefer just to reign, reign the way I am. Kind of an absurd thought, maybe. But maybe. Sometimes I, those thoughts come across my mind. I think to myself, it's too difficult, Lord. I can't, I can't. And at least this is better than nothing. But if you continue in this, what happened with Bartimaeus? Well, number one, you'll have the wrong kind of reputation. You'll taint your name. You will. I heard uh, somebody say one time, and he wasn't talking about spiritual things. Actually, he was the coach of an NFL team. And Tony Dungy used to, used to coach the Colts. He said this. He said, until you understand that your, your uh, testimony is as important as your salvation. When he said that, it caused me to think. Nothing's more important than my salvation. But if you think about it, why are we here? If you lose your, te uh, your testimony, if you lose your reputation, you're done. You're done. Your influence is gone. And you can only make so many mistakes. It's, a, it's a, something that I learned in the ministry alone when I first got into the ministry. You make some mistakes with people. My pastor took me aside and he said, you know what, your reputation is like change in your pocket. You only got so much of it. And every time uh, you make a mistake, you pay out. What happens when your pocket is empty? You can no longer pay. And I thought about that, and he's, he's right, of course. Look at verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side, Begging. We have no idea. This Timaeus is the first time, first and only time that that name is mentioned. So when I read that, I think to myself, why did the Lord find it necessary to include his dad's name? Why wasn't, it, why wasn't Bartimaeus enough? But it doesn't say just Bartimaeus. It says the son of Timaeus. I conclude that in the society, understanding Jewish society back there a little bit, um, the dad's reputation was, oh yeah, that's the guy that's got the blind son. Oh yeah, there's Timaeus right there. Yeah, he's the one that's got that blind son. You know that guy that was begging on the side? That's his son. And that was his reputation. The Jews believed uh, that, and, and we could go to that passage, I'm not going to have time, but they believed that any kind of, of problem there, um, physically or any of that, is a result of sin. We see that a little bit in the book of Job, right? They assumed, they insisted that the reason that Job's condition was a direct result of sin, didn't they? And so the Jewish people, you remember the man that was born blind? He was born blind? It may be Bartimaeus, I don't know. Some people say it is. But he was born blind. Born blind. In other words, he never could see. Well, when the Jews asked, you remember they asked, well, what? And so Jesus came along and they asked him and they said, who did sin, this man or his parents that he was born blind? What did they insinuate there? How could, if he was born blind, then in the womb he was blind. He never could see. The circuitry didn't operate right, ever. Well, if that blindness was a result of sin, how could that person conceived in the womb have possibly sinned to cause that? Well, they must have believed in some kind of reincarnation. Well, and of course, Jesus at that point said, well, no, it's not this man didn't sin, nor his parents, but that the glory of God would be revealed, I'm paraphrasing, forgive me. But 
you, you understand that this is the way the Jews see. So understanding that in the Jewish society, this Timaeus, probably a lot of people there probably figured Timaeus was a bad sinner. That's why his son was born blind. He didn't have a very good reputation, even though he did nothing. And when you're spiritually blind, whether you know it or not, your testimony is shot. All of us have shortcomings that we, have, that we must overcome. But you don't have to be known by those things. You don't have to be. Uh, I don't know how many times uh, you, you've got um, kids that grow up in a terrible home situation. Awful. You'll see this on the bus ride. I know you have. Or, or otherwise. And one, you've got two boys, say, grow up in exactly the same situation. One of them goes into terrible sin, and the other one lives for the Lord. How is that possible? Because the decision is theirs. One person never forgave, decided there was, and the other person did. I think it was on forgiveness, but that's not my point. My point is that you don't have to be known by those shortcomings. So if you remain spiritually, if we remain spiritually blind, we'll have the wrong kind of reputation. Number two, we'll sit when it's time to stand. Look at verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, talking about Christ, and a great number of people. So the Lord is walking by, and a great number of people are walking with him. So when the Lord was walking by, what should everybody have been doing? Standing and walking with the Lord. But we have blind Bartimaeus, sat by the, um, the, some say, sat by the highway side begging. So everyone else is standing, everyone else is moving around with the Lord, but blind Bartimaeus is sitting. I think this is so important. Because if you don't realize your, your condition of spirit, if I don't, then what ends up happening is when there's a stand to be taking, taken, we'll be sitting. We're not going to back those things. People, um, there's a vision that the Lord gives a church, gives the pastor of a church, there's a vision. And when somebody is spiritually directed properly and has perception, they're going to fall in line with that vision. And people that are not will not. So, we, we, should we stand when it's time to stand? Yes. But when you're spiritually blind, just like Bartimaeus, you will not. You won't have the strength to stand. You won't have the strength to contribute when it's, when it's time to do so because you've been spiritually blind. You'll have to take a seat on the bench. Those good players, they're in the game, aren't they? And the players that haven't made it or aren't as good or didn't put the time in or whatever, they're going to be sitting on the bench. I don't know about you, and I never wanted to sit on the bench. I've had to. Because I'm not a basketball player. So I actually played basketball in college, and I was horrible. And uh, so I sat on the bench. I remember the coach put me in because he knew I was going to fall out. I fouled out every game. I'm saying it was in two minutes, and I was done. Five fouls. Because I couldn't figure out if it was a foul or not. So I'm trying to play soccer when it's basketball, and I'm cutting in there and other and blowing the whistle and blowing the whistle, whatever, you know. So then eventually the coach said, all right, this is what I want you to do. you got one foul left. I want you just to stand underneath the basket and do nothing. So on defense, I just stood there with my arms down, all this action going on around me. Anyway, so I've had to sit the bench, but I didn't like it. When somebody's spiritually blind, you've got to sit, sit the bench there. You're not going to have the strength to stand. And then, I think this is maybe obvious, if you remain in this condition, you'll take and give nothing back. He was a beggar, wasn't he? What could blind Bartimaeus do for people? Very little. All he could do is receive. He couldn't give very much back. And if you remain spiritually blind, you have no perception. You, you haven't heard God's spirit. There's been difficulties there for you, and you may not even know it. Um, you're not going to be able to give very much. And you'll typically be a drain. Because you know, these are the people that over and over and over again, it's like you trod the same thing over and over and over and over again. I think to a large degree, it's a lack of vision. I remember there was a boy at a camp I went to. I used to go to Triple S Christian Ranch, uh, John Bishop. Maybe you've heard of him. So we were too far from there. So we'd take the young people there every year. And one year, I can remember, it was during the swim time, and all the boys were there. And uh, he was blind. He was a, a young man, teenager. He was blind. And it amazed me. It's one of those things you see and never forget. So they had a diving board, right, those things you jump on. And uh, he wanted to jump into the pool. So I thought, there's no way. <laughs> there's no way. He's blind. He doesn't even know. It, to him, it's, a, it's an abyss. I mean, what would he know? Flying through the air? That kid, they took him right up to the end of the diving board and uh, put him right to, so he could feel the edge right there. And when everything was clear, they said, okay, go. And he 
jumped. He took off. I couldn't believe it. Splash of water had a great time. But he needed some assistance, didn't he? He couldn't get out there on his own. He needed people to help him. I'm assuming, I'm just assuming this, that all of you here would like to be a service and a help to people. But if you remain spiritually blind, you'll always need assistance. You'll never get to the point where you can help other people. And that's not what the Lord wants for you. So how do you know if you're blind spiritually? Okay, let's answer that question. Look at verse 46 again. And when they came to Jericho, Jericho, if you remember, was destroyed by Joshua. And then there the prophet said that that city was going to be built again. But, but woe or judgment to them by whom it is built. We get to um, 1 Kings 16. And there the Bible says, and in his days did he... Uh, Hiel, H-E-I-I-E-L, the Bethelite, build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof, and Abiram, his firstborn, and set the gates thereof, and his youngest son. And uh, according to the word of the Lord, was spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. What, so he built up, that's it, this man, built up that which was destroyed. He built up again that which was destroyed, and God destroyed it. And he built it up again. Galatians 2.18 says this, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. A transgressor. Here's the point. If you go back to those things, maybe you've got victory in your life in some, in some ways. But then you tend to go back to it again. Okay, you tend to go back to those things. You build up again those things which are destroyed. There, there is a wall maybe between, built because of sin or whatever it might be between you and the Lord. This wall is built up. And then through some kind of revival or whatever it might be, that wall was knocked down. But if you're spiritually blind, it's like you're building that wall up again. And you make yourself a transgressor. What before was blatantly wrong, all of a sudden you begin to make excuses for. What before was obviously wrong. No question. No, well, no. If you tend to do that, you're blind. Number two... Like Bartimaeus, of course, he was begging, wasn't he? He had no victory over the world. He had to succumb himself to the world's system of help. And in that time, they didn't have government assistance, so he had to beg. He had to. There was no choice. And if you have very little strength against the world, which I fear happens a lot, then you'll um, probably spiritually blind. I guess what I'm saying is, if you spend time in the world, if you spend time adhering to the world's system of things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, as it says in 1 John chapter 2, I promise you, God will be working, and you'll be blind to it. You won't perceive it. The world's system is contrary. The world's system would have you begging, like Bartimaeus. You're a Christian. You're a son and a daughter of God. It's not to be that way. And yet Satan, who is master of the world's system, can direct you. And can, and can subject your, you to its will. Now you understand, you'll not have a testimony then. So, you know, I, we find it necessary for myself and for, for the staff here to, to, to help you to understand over and over and over again, be careful with that phone. Be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. We've seen and we've heard it's the ruin of people. The ruin. And uh, because you're piping in the world system there. You have to agree, it is worldliness all the way through it. And so you, you go to see something, maybe, maybe some kind of entertainment or whatever, and other things show up there, don't they? What's the point of all of that? Well, if you ingest enough of that, how are you going to be able to see? Stay away from it. Be careful. Be careful. So if you have no victory over the world, you're remain, that, that's, that's a pretty good indication. If you can't keep yourself from some things, that's a pretty good indication that you're spiritually blind. Number three, like Bartimaeus, you know Jesus is there, but you cannot see him. So when you're out there and the Holy Spirit directs you, you know Christ speaks to us through God's Spirit, okay, and the Comforter. I'm not going to get into all of that. I'm just going to say it. But oftentimes you don't see it. Those times where God's Spirit will say, go, go talk to that person. Give, give him a track. Do this. Don't go there. Don't go there. Be careful where you go there. Don't look at that. After time, you know what happens? That voice becomes obscured. You can't hear it anymore. 
the protection that's afforded you through the wonderful spirit that lives within us is, is gone. I'm telling you, you cannot but be spiritually blind at that point. That's a good gauge. So, and then lastly, you have no testimony. We've already covered that. Look at verse 48. And many charged him, notice this, and many charged him, talking about Bartimaeus, that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Um, before that, let's see, and when he... Uh, when he heard that he was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry. Um, oh, yes, oh, right there, of course. 48, and many charged him that he should hold his peace. What does that mean? Thou son of David, be quiet. Right? Be quiet. He's, be quiet. He, he's, he's got other things to do. You be quiet. Wasn't much of a testimony there, was there? Maybe at work, your testimony shot. You might praise the Lord. You know what they're going to say? Be quiet. Be quiet. It's blindness. You have no testimony. I can remember, it's a shock, you might remember this, Midland Grocery. Remember Midland Grocery? I worked at Midland Grocery. Anyway, it was just big distribution of things. We would go get things ready for the trucks to take out to Walgreens or whatever it might be. So a bunch of us worked there, and we had those pallet jacks, and we're zooming all over the place, picking the things and getting them ready. And uh, there, there was those of us who were in college, and then there was kind of everybody else. And they hated us. <laughs> they hated us. Oh, my word. We'd have things written in, in, uh, that, that were, I can't even, they're obscene things, written about us all over the marker, you know. People hated us. They wanted nothing to do with it. Do you know why? Because we were light. Mm -hmm. And they preferred darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. So um, are you uh, able to uh, fit in real nice with worldly people at work? Is it no problem? I'm not saying we shouldn't try to reach them. You follow what I'm saying. But there's a definite line there. There should be. Okay, so how can our sight be restored? Let's wrap it up here. i got a few minutes. You say to yourself, well, to be honest with you, I do have a problem sometimes with worldliness. I can't, I can't stay away from it sometimes. I, I feel like I don't have much of a testimony. Um, people at work just, they don't, they don't it's, it's, there's, I've got nothing. They've got power over me. I feel like a beggar. I feel like I'm blind. I feel like that way sometimes. Well, praise the Lord. Your sight can be restored. Let's look at Bartimaeus. Look at verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. So what did Bartimaeus want? One word. Mercy, 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 mercy. As if it wasn't enough that he was humbled, that he had to beg because he was a blind person, then he's crying out mercy. All he wanted was mercy. So I think if we just humble ourselves, God's good. He is good. Yes, he's, he must judge because he's holy, but he's good. He doesn't want you to remain where you are. He wants you to, to, to get, but you have to humble yourself and realize, Lord, I, I've been wrong. These blind spots that you're now showing me, I didn't realize they were there. Or I didn't take care of it. I was lax in those things. I was lazy. I didn't show very good character. I need help. Please help me. Have mercy. You humble yourself. Notice that that's what caused Jesus to stop. Aren't you glad about that? Number two, abandon your trust in the world. It's a trust. And if you say to yourself, boy, I, I can stand to lose most things, but don't take away. 49b says, and they called the blind man, saying to him, be a good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, what does it say there? Casting away his garment. That garment, as I understand it, was a specific garment. Um, maybe it was something that Bartimaeus was known for. And so when uh, he wore that garment, kind of like the prophets, they knew that there was a prophet because of that. I'm not saying that there was necessarily a particular garment that blind people wore, but they knew Bartimaeus' garment. But he was done with it. Isn't that awesome? He was done with it. <laughs> so it's as if he's saying, I'm not going to be blind anymore. Jesus just stopped and he called me. Abandon your trust in the world. Abandon the way, the way you're known for. Just abandon that. I'm going to tell you something. The world, listen to me. The world takes and takes and takes and takes and takes until you are nothing. There's nothing left of you. That's what the world does. It gives nothing back. It gives you nothing. Nothing. 
The only, the only way that anybody is good for the world is what the world can take from them. And then ask Jesus to make things plain. Ask him, Lord, am I blind? What, am I not seeing some things? Is my perception gone? I can't remain this way. I can't stay this way. Notice what it says in 51. And Jesus answered and said unto him, <clears throat> What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Maybe you simply need to say, Lord, I, I, give me sight. Help me to see these things. That thing, maybe I made excuses before, for, and I didn't realize. I justified responding in anger to that person. I've been gossiping about whoever. I've had a bad attitude. I've had a pity party. I've considered myself to be a victim. Whatever. That, that produces spiritual blindness. Ask the Lord to help you to see. Let's pray. Mm-hmm.